Hello guys, this is Indian Medico and in this video, we are going to see about blepharitis. First, let us discuss about chronic marginal blepharitis. Chronic blepharitis is a common cause of ocular discomfort and irritation. There are two forms of chronic blepharitis. They are anterior and posterior blepharitis. Usually, both these conditions overlap and the patient presents with mixed blepharitis. Now, let us discuss about anterior blepharitis in detail. In this case, there is inflammation in the area surrounding places of lashes. Anterior blepharitis can be further subdivided into staphylococcal blepharitis or seborrheic blepharitis. In anterior blepharitis, there will be chronic infective elements, so it is more available to treatment and there will be remission when compared to posterior blepharitis. Now, let us discuss about staphylococcal blepharitis. In this case, there will be abnormal cell mediated response to components of cell wall of Staphylococcus aureus, which causes red eyes and peripheral corneal infiltrates. Staphylococcal blepharitis is more marked in patients with atopic dermatitis. Seborrheic blepharitis is associated with generalized seborrheic dermatitis. Now let us discuss about posterior blepharitis. In this case, there will be meibomian gland dysfunction and alterations in meibomian gland secretions. Bacterial lipases lead to the formation of free fatty acids, which increases melting point of meibom, thus preventing its expression from glands. This eventually leads to ocular surface irritation and growth of Staphylococcus aureus. Posterior blepharitis is more persistent and it is a chronic inflammatory condition when compared to anterior blepharitis. Posterior blepharitis is associated with acne rosacea. Now let us discuss about mite in chronic blepharitis. Demodex follicularum longus is implicated in anterior blepharitis whereas Demodex follicularum brevis is implicated in posterior blepharitis. Now let us discuss about the features of blepharitis. There will be lash deposits which will be hard in case of staphylococcal anterior blepharitis whereas the lash deposits will be soft in case of seborrheic anterior blepharitis. Lash loss, distorted lashes or trichiasis can also be seen in case of anterior blepharitis. Lid margin ulceration can be seen in case of staphylococcal anterior blepharitis. Lid margin notching is more prominent in case of posterior blepharitis. Hordeolum cyst can be seen in staphylococcal anterior blepharitis whereas meibomian cyst can be seen in case of posterior blepharitis. Conjunctival flictinule can be seen in case of staphylococcal anterior blepharitis. Tear film foaming is seen in case of posterior blepharitis. Dry eye, corneal punctate erosions, vascularization and infiltrates can all be seen in all types of blepharitis. However, they are more prominent in case of posterior blepharitis. Remember, staphylococcal anterior blepharitis is associated with atopic dermatitis. Seborrheic anterior blepharitis is associated with seborrheic dermatitis. Posterior blepharitis is associated with acne rosacea. Now let us discuss about the symptoms of chronic blepharitis. It will usually be bilateral and symmetrical. There will be no visual disturbance. There will be disruption of normal ocular surface function and there will be reduction in tear stability. There will be stinging especially in case of posterior blepharitis. There will be burning, grittiness, mild photophobia, crusting and redness of lid margins with remissions and exasperations. The symptoms will be worse in mornings and contact lens will be poorly tolerated. Now let us discuss about the signs of staphylococcal blepharitis. There will be hard scales and crusting around bases of lashes as you can see in this picture. Staphylococcal blepharitis is associated with cholerates that is cylindrical corrections around lash bases. There will be mild papillary conjunctivitis and chronic conjunctival hyperemia. In long standing cases there can be scarring and notching of lid margin, metarosis, trichiasis and poliosis. There will be associated tear film instability and dry eye syndrome. Atopic keratoconjunctivitis can be seen in atopic dermatitis which is associated with staphylococcal blepharitis. Now let us discuss about the signs of seborrheic blepharitis. There will be hyperemic and greasy anterior lid margins as you can see in this picture. There will also be soft scales and adherence of lashes to each other. Now let us discuss about the signs of posterior blepharitis which is a meibomian gland disease. There will be excessive and abnormal meibomian gland secretion. There will be capping of meibomian gland orifices with oil globules as you can see in this picture. There will be pouting, recession or plugging of meibomian gland orifices as you can see in this picture. There will be hyperemia and telangiectasias of posterior lid margin. When we apply pressure on lid margin, it will lead to expression of meibomian fluid which will be turbid or toothpaste like as you can see in this picture. In severe cases, the secretions become inspissated and expression is almost impossible. Lid transillumination will reveal gland loss and cystic dilatation of meibomian ducts. Tear film is oily and foamy and froth may accumulate on lid margins or inner canthae as you can see in this picture. Now let us discuss about Demodex infestation. In Demodex infestation, signs include cylindrical dandruff like scaling that is cholerates around base of eyelashes. Mites can be seen at a magnification of 16x in slit lamp. 
they can be seen by gently rotating lash with fine forceps or they can be seen when the lashes are epilated and using slight microscopy. Now let us discuss about the secondary changes of chronic blepharitis. There can be papillary conjunctivitis, inferior corneal punctate epithelial erosions, corneal scarring and vascularization including Salzman nodular degeneration and advancing wave like epitheliopathy type changes. There can also be associated stye formation and marginal keratitis. Rarely chronic blepharitis can lead to bacterial keratitis especially in case of contact lens virus and flictinular eye disease. Now let us discuss about the treatment of chronic blepharitis. Permanent cure is unlikely. We can only control the symptoms. We have to advise lit hygiene once or twice daily. First we have to give warm compresses. This will soften crusts at bases of lashes. Then we have to advise lip cleaning. This will mechanically remove crusts and other debris. We have to advise scrubbing lid margins with cotton bud dipped in warm dilute solution of baby shampoo or sodium bicarbonate. We can also advise expression of accumulated baby bum by rolling the finger anteriorly over the lid margin. Now let us discuss about antibiotics in case of chronic blepharitis. Topical sodium fusidic acid, erythromycin, bacitracin, azithromycin or chloramphenicol can be prescribed in case of active folliculitis. Oral antibiotic regimens include doxycycline, tetracyclines or azithromycin. These can be given in severe cases. Erythromycin 250mg once or twice daily is an alternative. Other treatment options include plant and fish oil supplements, topical steroids in the form of fluoromethylone 0.1% or lotiprednol 4 times a day for 1 week can be prescribed. TS substitutes can be given. Coming to the treatment of demodex infestation, we can treat such patients with tea tree oil. We can prescribe topical permethrin and topical or oral ivermectin. We should also advise high temperature cleaning of bedding. Now let us discuss about novel therapies for chronic blepharitis. Topical cyclosporin can be given. Pulsed light application and purpose designed devices to probe heat or express mavobian glands that is lipe flow can be tried in case of posterior blepharitis. This picture shows lipe flow which is a novel therapy for posterior blepharitis. Now let us discuss about thyreasis palpebrum. Crab louse that is thyreasis pubis is present in pubic hair. It can infect the eyelids in which case it is called as thyreasis palpebrum. Symptoms of thyreasis palpebrum include chronic irritation and itching of lids. The lice will usually be an incidental discovery and it will be readily visible anchored to the lashes as you can see in this picture. Remember lice has 6 legs whereas ticks have 8 legs. Coming to the treatment of thyreasis palpebrum, we have to do mechanical removal of lice and their attached lashes with fine forceps as you can see in this picture. Topical yellow mercury oxide 1% or petroleum jelly can be applied to lashes and lids twice daily for 10 days. We should also do delousing of patient, family members, clothing and bedding to prevent recurrence. Now let us discuss about tick infestation of eyelid. Ticks can attach to eyelid. They should be removed at the earliest. Ticks can be associated with diseases like Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain fever, African tick bite fever or tularemia. We can use insect repellent containing pyrethrin or a pyrethroid when the tick is away from the eye. Scabies cream containing permethrin can also be used. All these prevent the tick from injecting saliva and after 24 hours it should drop off. Ticks can also be removed with fine tipped forceps at the slit lamp. In Lyme disease endemic areas, routine doxycycline prophylaxis is given following confirmed deer tick bite. The signs of tick infestation include erythema migrans. African tick bite fever is also associated with rickettsial infection. This picture shows tick infestation of eyelid and this is after removal. Now let us discuss about angular blepharitis. It is usually caused by Moraxella lacunata or Staphylococcus aureus. It can rarely be caused by herpes simplex virus. In angular blepharitis, there will be red, scaly, macerated and fissured skin at lateral or medial canthi of one or both eyes as you can see in this picture. In some cases, there can be skin chafing secondary to tear overflow at lateral canthus which can cause a similar picture. This makes the lid more prone for infection. Angular blepharitis is associated with papillary and follicular conjunctivitis. The treatment of angular blepharitis is with topical chloramphenicol, bacitracin or erythromycin. Now let us discuss about childhood blepharoconjunctivitis or BKC. It is a poorly defined condition. It is more severe in Asian and Middle Eastern populations. BKC usually occurs around 6 years of age and there will be recurrent episodes of anterior or posterior blepharitis. It is also associated with recurrent styes or calesia. There will be constant eye rubbing and photophobia. So it can be misdiagnosed as allergic eye disease. 
conjunctival changes in BKC include diffuse hyperemia, bulbar flictans, and follicular or papillary hyperplasia. Corneal changes include superficial punctate keratopathy, marginal keratitis, peripheral vascularization, and axial subepithelial ACE. This picture shows a child with blepharokeratic conjunctivitis. Now let us discuss about the treatment of BKC. Lidigine and topical antibiotic ointment can be prescribed at bedtime. Topical low-dose steroids in the form of prednisolone 0.1% or fluoromethylone 0.1% can be prescribed. Erythromycin syrup in the dose of 125 mg daily for 4 weeks can be given. Thank you.